In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. In the midst of such stately beauty and exquisite gladness, is it irreverent of me to point out that Easter this year falls on the same day as one of our stranger secular holidays, April Fools? This intersection doesn't happen as often as you might imagine. The last time Easter fell on April 1st was way back in 1956, and the next won't be until 2029. So I figure if I'm ever going to preach on the crossing of faith and fools, it had better be today. Unlike Easter, the origin of April Fool's Day is unclear. Some trace it back to Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, which in 1392 mentions tricks being played on the 32nd day of March. Others think it came about in the late 1500s when Europe switched from the Roman calendar to the Gregorian and some poor fools didn't get the message that New Year's Day was now in January, not at the end of March. Still others go all the way back to the Bible when Noah sent the raven on a fool's errand to search for dry land when waters still covered the face of the earth. And, you know, perhaps it's just about spring the vernal equinox, and Mother Nature's tendency to play tricks on us in April with capricious changes in weather. Three inches of snow tomorrow, right? No matter the source, April 1st is known for tricks and tomfoolery. Hardly meet and write for the most triumphant, exuberant day in the Christian church. We are here to celebrate the pinnacle of our faith, the climax and great reveal of the gospel. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Today in churches all over the world, Christians shout this good news in one voice. Believers trust in its truth because there were people who saw it with their own eyes. Those present to Jesus' death who became witnesses to his resurrection which is why, as a rule, the Gospel of Mark is not the preferred preacher's text for Easter Sunday. You may have noticed in our Gospel lesson this morning that the resurrected Jesus never makes an appearance. In Matthew's Gospel, the risen Jesus appears first to the women at the tomb, then to the disciples in Galilee who are sent out to preach the good news to all nations. In Luke and John, the Easter stories go even further with extensive and detailed accounts of the post-resurrection Jesus appearing here and there in the garden on the beach to persuade and inspire and commission his followers. In all three of these Gospels, sorrow and fear turn to shock, then amazement, then gladness, then rejoicing and the Christian church is born. But in the Gospel of Mark, we hear instead these eight short verses, an unsettling story of three grieving women walking to a tomb at dawn to complete the ritual of Jewish burial by anointing Jesus' body with spices. And these women aren't sure if they'll even be able to get to Jesus' body because his tomb has been sealed with a huge, heavy stone. When they arrive to see that the stone has been rolled back and the tomb is open. They see a figure in dazzling white who calmly tells them the crucified Jesus has been raised. Look, he says to them, he's not here. He's gone to Galilee, as he said he would. Now, go tell Peter and the others. We might expect these women to do as they're told. We might expect them to be happy Instead, the last word in Mark describes the very people entrusted to deliver the good news of the resurrection. Staggering into the sunlight, confused and terrified, before running away and telling no one. Do these women think they're being played? Is it all a cruel joke? We know, of course, how this movie ends. 
we have those other gospels and the fervent testimony of the early apostles. We have overwhelming evidence that a frightened and persecuted people were utterly transformed and empowered by faith in the risen Christ and against all odds succeeded in changing the world. And you may have your own resurrection stories, little glimpses of God's grace, moments of transcendence when hope rises from despair, when deep love gives meaning to unspeakable pain, when new life springs forth from the grave. Still, for now, let us stay with these frightened women as they flee from the tomb. Theirs may be the story we most need to hear, we 21st century Christians, as we celebrate Easter on April Fool's Day. Because for all we know from Mark's gospel, the joke is on them. And for all we know from Twitter and cable news and the front page of any paper, the joke is on us. To anyone paying attention to how the world works, the message of the cross is at best foolishness and at worst a scandal. The Apostle Paul says it flat out in his letter to the Corinthians. God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Now, no one wants to be thought of as foolish or weak. Yet Paul is unequivocal. If we are to preach Christ crucified in our day and age, then we cannot ignore God's cosmic joke of being born as a helpless infant in a backwater, emptying himself of divine power, serving and eating and healing the dregs of human society, then being executed as a criminal and raised from the dead. We cannot pretend away the foolishness of this proclamation. We must take up the comedy of the cross as well as its tragedy. Because if we take ourselves too seriously, if we come across as defensive or judgmental or self-righteous, then we're in trouble. We might as well spit into the wind. So with that, I stand before you unapologetically to say, I can't imagine a better day to stake our claim as fools for Christ than when Easter Sunday falls on April 1st. The Holy Fool. It's a long-standing and colorful tradition in the Christian church. Radical priest and theologian Kenneth Leach describes Holy Fools as individuals whose bizarre conduct and clown-like antics betray a deep identification with the marginalized and the wretched of our world. Leach suggested that in times of social and ecclesiological complacency, Holy Fools serve as a reminder of the scandal of the cross and as prophets calling the world to task for its injustice and cruelty. Some holy fools go to extreme lengths to expose the madness of the system through their own eccentric behavior. Like fools in Shakespeare, Holy fools get away with speaking truth to power because everyone assumes they're crazy. One such fool was Saint Simeon of Emesa, whose miracles and saintly acts of compassion managed to fly under the radar while he threw nuts at the clergy, blew out the altar candles, and spent Good Friday eating sausages in the common square. Saint Francis of Assisi is the church's most famous holy fool. After being disinherited from his, by his wealthy father, Francis joyfully lived in extreme poverty as a beggar and a preacher and an imitator of Christ. Francis is said to have talked to animals, preached to birds, embraced lepers, and once stripped off all his clothes before the bishop to illustrate his conversion. I'm not recommending that last one necessarily. But you know, there's something to be said for the spirit of play, of sacred folly, and holy risk-taking, of laughter, especially in church, especially on Easter, 
In the medieval church on Easter, congregations were urged by the, tree, the priest to celebrate the joy of the resurrection with extended fits of laughter, and the priest would often tell off-color jokes just to get the party started. The ability to laugh at ourselves, to be tickled by the sheer absurdity of life, to recognize with gladness the face of God in a complete stranger, all this levels the playing field for us and opens the possibility of transcendence and transformation. It unleashes the power of a child's wonder, a poet's fancy, a lover's giddiness. I believe it points us to God. What do you think? Does the shape of this fool's cap remind you of anything? <coughs> Maybe something on the roof of our church? I believe we are called by God to holy foolishness. I think it's another way of understanding our call to love. And I truly believe the world depends on it. We human creatures balance between beauty and affliction, indifference and redemption, accident and meaning. We have been given the freedom to decide whether or not to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our God. It's our choice. But on one side, there's this self-centered, tangible benefit, right? And on the other, nothing but a promise of a life that really is life. Last month, singer-songwriter Brandy Carlisle released her new album, its title is, By the Way, I Forgive You. And there's a song on it called The Joke. It's about a young boy and a young girl, both of whom are made to feel unworthy, unlovely, ridiculed by their peers and diminished by the hard hand of social conformity and stigma and shame. And the chorus gently reassures them, promises them something with these words. Let them laugh while they can. Let them spin. Let them scatter in the wind. I've been to the movies. I've seen how it ends. And the joke is on them. On this April Fool's Easter day, we are asked to put all our eggs in God's basket. God promises it will all be worth it. The uncertainty, the sacrifice, the leap of faith. Even when all we see is an empty tomb. Even when surrounded by evidence of the capacity for greed and corruption and violence and those who profit from another's pain. Even then. We know that's not how it ends. We've been let in on the joke. The God of love and forgiveness and new life always gets the last laugh.